the Apostles this Sunday, January the 21st, 2024. Uh, today's message is going to be titled, The Man from Bethel. Uh, and this has nothing to do with Bethel Church in Redding, California, or any of its practices, but the Bethel of the Bible. Uh, specifically, I'm going to outline the story of Jacob. Uh, in scripture and, and how that plays out how his life demonstrates or is an example for the Christian life uh, he was a man who has seen God who had an encounter with God who, who knows what it's like to struggle and wrestle with God and, and wrestle with issues of the spiritual life uh, who knew what it was like to wrestle to overcome The life of Jacob. God, of course, elected Jacob to prevail. Jacob was first and foremost chosen of God. We're going to see in this message that early on, Rebecca and Jacob sought to do God's work through human machinations. To this end, Jacob secured the blessing and birthright through craftiness. In doing so, he secured a whole bunch of trouble, and as a result, he had to leave home. Doing things man's way instead of God's way leads to trouble. And of course, uh, several issues Jacob had to deal with as he went on this diaspora was that one, Esau, his brother, wanted to kill him. And when he left, he was exploited by his uncle Laban. Exploited, misused. Jacob came first to Bethel and saw angels ascending and descending on a ladder. He endured hardship under his uncle Laban for 20 years to get his wives and his property. But God was with Jacob through these troubles. And eventually God calls Jacob home. He flees Laban. He gets on a collision course with Esau. And so therefore he goes to Bethel. He contends for blessing when he runs out of options. Jacob finally learns his lesson. This is the overall outline of what we're going to talk about here. So let's get into the uh, text themselves. God elected Jacob to prevail. How do we know that? Genesis 25, 20 to 23. And Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah the wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Pad and Aram, and sister to Laban the Syrian. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. So we see once again more children of promise. We know Isaac himself was a child of promise. Isaac was only born because God intervened, because God touched Sarah's womb and opened her womb, and Isaac was born. And, and so now... We have another miracle birth, only this time Isaac is seeking the Lord for a miracle. Isaac got more than what he bargained for here, folks. Abraham sought the Lord, believed the promises of God, persevered in faith, and got one son. But we're going to see here that Jacob got two sons. And we see here in the text as we continue in Genesis 25 that the children struggled in the womb. Esau and Jacob were wrestling with each other when they was in Rebekah's womb. And it must have been more than just the normal kicks because Rebekah inquired of the Lord. Verse 23. And the Lord said unto her, and folks, this is where Jacob is chosen. Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. This ran counter to the Near Eastern cultures of that time. It was normal that the firstborn son would inherit the birthright. Well, would they, it's called primogeniture. He would get the bulk of the inheritance he would be considered the head of the family. But God decided in this case that was not so. And of course, Esau was the firstborn, 
And then Jacob was the second born. Jacob was chosen. Esau's not. And, and in Romans where it talks about divine election, and it's talking about Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated, he's not talking about the individual so much, but Esau and Jacob as representations of nations. God elected Jacob to prevail. He elected Jacob to found Israel. We're going to see here, as we go through the life of Jacob, that very early on, Rebekah and Jacob sought to do God's work by human machination. And there was some strife in uh, Isaac's household because Isaac loved Esau. Esau was Isaac's pick. Isaac was determined he was going to bless Esau, raise up Esau. Esau was going to carry on the family name. Esau was going to be the inheritor of the covenants of Abraham. But God had already said Jacob was going to do that. And so early on, Rebekah and Jacob were going to sought to do this through human machination. They sought it to do this through craftiness, through schemes. And we're going to see as we go through Jacob's life, he outwits his older brother and steals the birthright and steals the blessing. Jacob secured the blessing and the birthright through craft. Now in Genesis 25, 29 to 33, we see an account here where Esau has went out hunting, came, and he was starving to death, and he is about to ask Jacob for basically a bowl of porridge. And Jacob says, I'll sell it to you if you sell me your birthright. Well, we'll have a transaction here. You sell me your birthright, I'll sell you this bowl, a bowl of porridge for the birthright. Verse 31, and Jacob said, sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die. And what profit shall this birthright do to me? And Jacob said, Swear to me this day. And he swore unto him and sold his birthright unto Jacob. Esau sold his birthright for a bowl of food. And we go on in a text and we see Esau despised his birthright. Or thought he did. He was in tears later. When it was too late. But Jacob, through craftiness, acquired the birthright that was due to Esau by virtue of being the firstborn in a simple commercial transaction. How many sell their souls to the world? How many sell their souls to Satan? For a bowl of food, for, for their day in the sun. How many compromise themselves to get a bigger platform? Let us not be like Esau. Jacob acquired that through craft. And the, the birthright wasn't the only thing. As Isaac came near to die, and it would be the custom back then, as the father would be aging and he would get ready to die, or when he thought he was going to die, he would line up the sons and he would speak the blessing. And so Isaac had in mind here that he was going to bestow the blessing upon Esau. And what was this blessing? It was the promises he inherited, his standing in the covenant of Abraham. Isaac had received the blessings of the Abrahamic covenant and was about to then hand Esau. And Rebekah had overheard this. She became informed that this was about to happen and we read in Genesis 27 6 to 10 and, and here is where Rebecca is, is going to scheme she's going to coach Jacob on what he needs to do to steal the, the blessing and Rebecca spake unto Jacob her son saying behold I heard thy father speak unto Esau thy brother saying bring me venison and make me savory meat that I may eat and bless thee before the Lord before my death. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice according to that which I command you. So Rebecca is now about to coach Jacob into how he can steal the blessing. 
how he can acquire it through trickery, through craftiness. And this is what she says in verse 9. Go now to the flock and fetch me from hence two good kids of the goats, and I will make them savory meat for thy father, such as he loveth. And thou shalt bring it to thy father, that he may eat, and that he may bless thee before his death. So what's happening? Isaac has already talked to Esau. Esau's out on the hunt. As this is happening, as she's having this conversation with Jacob, Esau is hunting for the game, for the savory meat. Now, there's a little background behind the savory meat that some uh, of those in the audience who've ever done hunting or ever ate from wild game, you may know that if you catch something in the wild, people will talk about it has a gamey taste. It tastes different. Even if you're hunting for something in the wild of which there is a farm-raised version, the wild version tastes a little different. The diet's a little different. The lifestyle's a little different. And, and that affects the quality of the meat. And so Rebecca, is, what she's doing here is she's going to take uh, something that's a part of their flocks, domesticated. A domesticated goat in this case. She's going to season it up. Apparently, she has the skill to put some spices, and the text doesn't tell us exactly how she does it, but she's able to season that where by the time she's done cooking it and seasoning it, it will taste just like a wild goat. And so she's telling uh, him, I'm going to do this. You bring it to your father so that he blesses you instead of Esau. Now, Jacob's a crafty one, but he has some concerns here because he sees how this plot might fail. In verses, uh, as we're going in 11 to 17, in verse 11, Jacob said to Rebekah's mother, Behold, Esau is my brother, is a hairy man, and I am a smooth man. That simply means that Jacob had the habit of being clean shaven. He didn't have a lot of hair. He was smooth maybe shaved. Jacob dwelt in the tents. Jacob was more of a domestic man. Esau was the wild man who went out on the hunt. My father, peradventure, will feel me, and I shall see him as a deceiver, and I shall bring a curse upon me, and not a blessing. So Jacob's concerned. He'll feel him. He'll see the smooth skin, or he'll feel his face and see where he's shaven, and say, hey, you're not Esau. And back then, children feared the curse. There was a fear of the father's curse, just as there was anticipation of the father's blessing. The cursing and blessing of the father meant a lot more in, in that culture than what we might think of it today. So Jacob has some concerns here. This is what Rebecca, his mother, said. And his mother said unto him, Upon me be thy curse, my son. Only obey my voice and go fetch me them. And he went and fetched and brought them to his mother, and his mother made savory meat such as his father loved. And Rebekah took goodly raiment of her eldest son Esau, which were with her in the house, and put them upon Jacob, her younger son. And she put the skins of the kids of the goats upon his hands and upon the smooth of his neck. And she gave the savory meat and the bread which she had prepared into the hand of her son Jacob. <coughs> so she's put garments on him so Isaac feels on him. We hope he'll feel hairy arms. She did everything she could. And we're going to see in a minute the only thing she couldn't was change Jacob's voice. And the ploy almost failed. But it didn't. So Jacob went in served it. Isaac was saying, you, you feel like Esau, but you look like Jacob. And so he questions him. Jacob reassures him he's Esau. And Isaac gives Jacob the blessing. And as soon as Jacob leaves, just minutes after Jacob leaves with the blessing, Esau comes in. 
and pleads with Isaac for the blessing. And of course, Isaac says, I've already blessed him. And in verses 34 to 43 of Genesis 27 here, when Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with a great and exceeding bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, even though also, O my father. And he said, Thy brother came with subtlety and hath taken away thy blessing. So Esau, or Jacob, I should say, acquired and has now both the blessing and the birthright through craftiness, through subtlety. But like all human machinations, there's unintended consequences. There, there's a dark side. There's a cost to pay. You have the pros and you have the cons. Jacob conned Esau, and he's about to get the cons of his con. Because you see, he secured a whole bunch of trouble and had to leave home. As we continue on in Genesis 27, as we continue on in the story, we see here that Esau is consoling himself, planning to kill Jacob. Verse 41, And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, The days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then I will slay my brother Jacob. Continuing in verse 42, and these words of Esau, her elder son, were told to Rebekah. And she sent and called Jacob, her younger son, and said unto him, Behold, thy brother Esau, as touching thee, does comfort himself, purposing to kill thee. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice, and arise, flee thou to Laban, my brother, to Haran. So she's telling him to flee. And then she goes and tells Isaac that she uh, bewails her life. She despises her own life. She despairs because of the women that's around her. And so she pleads with him to send Jacob to Laban, her brother, because she does not want Jacob to be married to the, of the Canaanite women. And so Isaac sends him. And he goes to Laban, his brother. Jacob first came to Bethel. And he, this is where he saw the angels ascending and descending upon the ladder. So Isaac, Jacob is in route to his uncle. And we see here that he's going towards Haran. In verse 11, he alighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night. Because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. So he's sleeping on, on the ground. He's put some stones for pillows. He's sleeping. He's about to have a dream. He's about to get the revelation from God. This place is not named Bethel yet, but Jacob names it Bethel. This is his first encounter at Bethel. And he dreamed, verse 12, and behold, a ladder set up upon the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. So he's having a dream. He's seen the angels ascending. The angels are descending. He's having an encounter with the Lord. Verse 13, and behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father, and the God of Isaac. The land whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it and to thy seed. So God has revealed himself and said, I'm going to fulfill the promises of the Abrahamic covenant. You and your descendants are going to inherit those. And then, the second thing he does Thy sheep shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So not only is him and his seed going to be the inheritors, but he's given him the extent, the domain. And, of course, this finds fulfillment in Israel. 
And even very early on here, this language is suggesting something that's much broader than the piece of real estate that people are fighting over right now. But this is suggesting uh, eventually a worldwide dominion. And we're going to find out in a few minutes that that is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So the families are going to the east, the west, the north, and the south. And in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. This is talking about Christ. It is through Christ that the blessing comes to all the families on earth. And then in verse 15, Behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. So Jacob is starting his diaspora, which Israel was going to have several diasporas. You could think of the church, in a sense, as being in a diaspora. We are, we are not in the ultimate place that we're going to be in terms of our situation upon the earth. We're already there in Christ, but we're still going through our journey in the Lord. So God was going to keep Jacob as he was going through these places. He was going to be with him, just as he was with Israel in the diaspora, just as he is with us as we go through the Christian life as aliens in this world. He says, I will not leave thee till I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. So God was going to keep Jacob safe in all the places he was going to go, and he was going to bring him safely back to the promised land. Now the angels descending and ascending on the ladder is fulfilled in the king of Israel, and specifically in Jesus Christ. And we see this reference in the Gospel of John. Jesus is in the early stages of picking his disciples. He doesn't have all 12 of them in a row yet, but he's making some of his early choices, and he lights upon Nathaniel, and he begins a conversation with Nathaniel. And in verse 48, Nathaniel says unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Because Jesus had already talked to him and shared things that he knew about Nathaniel. He had told him that you are a true Israelite in whom there is no guile. And Nathaniel's thinking, how does he know this? Jesus answers and says unto him, Before that Philip called thee when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathaniel answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. That was the first thing he said. The second thing, which is directly relevant to what's happening with, with Jacob, is, is that thou art the king of Israel. Nathaniel realized that Jesus Christ is the king of Israel. He is the inheritor of the promise. He is the son of David. He is the Messiah. And so now that we have this background of Jesus as the Messiah, Jesus as the king of Israel... This is what Jesus tells him within this backdrop. And Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. So you see here, Jesus is revealed here as the king of Israel. And the last time that there was a reference to angels of God ascending, descending, it was before the man who was going to be named Israel, after whom the Israelite nation emerged. So the angels of God is the representation of heaven opening. It's a representation of uh, God revealing himself to the world for the purpose of establishing the nation of Israel. And by that, don't be confused with what's going on in the Middle East right now. When the Bible talks about the nation of Israel, it's not talking about the Democratic Socialist Administration that currently is ruling over there. It's talking about a fully restored Israel with Jesus the Messiah ruling as king. So all this angels ascending and descending is looking forward to Jesus Christ revealed. Revealed to Israel. 
and blessing all the families of the earth. When Jesus returns, when he's married to his bride, and Pastor Chris and I, we talked about this uh, in, in our last Wednesday word about how when we talk about the wife of Lamb, how the church and Israel are found together. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that on, on our next Wednesday word when we start looking at the New Jerusalem coming down from heaven. There are structures there that point to Israel. There's other structures in this building that point to the church. But the, and the church and Israel are found together as the wife of the Lamb, as the city of our God, as the domain of, of King Jesus. And so it finds its fulfillment there. And knowing this means that the life of Jacob, uh, we can draw inspiration from, we can see analogs, we can see parallels between how God worked with Jacob and what he plans to do for us as a church and for Israel moving forward. But in the meantime, after Jacob left Bethel that first time, he had to go through some trials. I remember the, the overwhelming joy I felt when I was first a believer in Jesus Christ. I was just excited to all get out. And I had no clue the things that were going to come upon me, how life was going to hit. And nobody does. You, you get that initial joy, and then the trials come, the tribulations come. And not everybody makes it through those. Some will fall out. Others will become totally unfruitful. Jacob has 20 years of diaspora, 20 years of hardships. We see uh, in, in Genesis 31 here, uh, and this is near the end of, uh, of that here, uh, just before Jacob leaves Laban, but this is what it says. And he heard the words of Laban's son, saying, Jacob hath taken away all that was our father's, and of that which is our father's hath he gotten all this glory. And Jacob, behold, the countenance of Laban, and behold, it was not towards him as before. So this is at the end of the 20 years. Jacob worked seven years for Rachel, and Laban deceived him and gave him Leah. So then he works another seven years, and he gets Rachel. And then he works six more years to acquire property. And Laban would deceive him, would change his wages. On one arrangement, all these striped sheep would be his. But the ones that were solid and color, Laban's. And of course, Laban thought, well, I've got this one. The odds are in my favor. But we see here in reading the text and reading the story that God turns it around. He gives Jacob this dream of them conceiving and instructs him what to do. And so we see that he lays these almond branches down uh, when they was about to conceive and it seemingly altered the outcome of the conception. And as a result, no matter what arrangement Laban would strike with Jacob, the sheep would be born in a way that they became Jacob's. And so over 20 years, uh, most of Laban's flocks became Jacob's. And this eventually started becoming noticed. Laban's sons were getting envious. And the countenance of Laban started to change. Have you all ever been in the situation where things are going good and then you can tell subtle differences in how somebody that used to get along with talked to you and you knew that your time with them was short and if you didn't exit that situation that things were going to go south? This is where Jacob was. And in this context, in verse 3 of Genesis 31, the Lord steps in. And the Lord speaks to him and says unto Jacob, Return unto the land of thy fathers and thy kindred, and I will be with thee. So after that, Jacob talks to his wives, and he explains to them what's going on. 
and they all agree, hey, let's pack up. So they flee. And the way the text reads suggests that they may have even fled in the middle of the night. It doesn't say in the middle of the night, but it's quite clear they was fleeing Laban. And it wasn't for several days until he finds out. And then he pursues him. He catches up with them. And so, but then God warns Laban, don't hurt Jacob. So they catch up, they have an agreement, and they go on peacefully. And so while Jacob is fleeing Laban, and afterwards as he was moving on, he was headed uh, towards Esau. And in the midst of this, God calls Jacob back home. Genesis 31, 13 to 17. Declaring, I am the God of Bethel, where thou anointest the pillar, where thou vowest a vow unto me. Now arise, get thee out of this land, and return to the land of thy kindred. For all the riches which God hath taken from our father, that is ours and our children's. Now then, whatsoever God hath said unto thee, do. Then Jacob rose up and led his sons and his wives upon their camels. So what's happening here? In the, in, in the first part of what I just quoted, uh, verse 13, where God tells him to go. And then Jacob has this conversation with his wives and they agree. And in the PowerPoint slide, after verse 13, I skipped to verse 16, where Jacob has a conversation with his wives. But in going over this, I would encourage the reader, I would encourage the listener to go and read that entire chapter in its context to get the idea of, of the flow of the story. And then in verse 32, starting in verse 1, and what's happening here, Jacob has left Laban. Laban is in his past. He is going on a collision course with Esau. And as he's called back to the promised land, it becomes inevitable that he's going to meet up with his brother. And he learns that his brother has a force of 400. So Esau has the manpower to completely wipe Jacob out. And Jacob is afraid. And Jacob makes plans. He separates him into different groups. That way, if Jacob gets attacked by Esau's forces, the family can flee and go somewhere else, and there's some gap. So Jacob goes to all these measures. But while he is on his way, the angels of God meet him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, This is God's host. And he called the name of the place Mahanaim. And Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, under the land of Sire, the country of Eden. And he commanded them, saying, Thus shall you speak to my lord Esau, thy servant Jacob, saith thus, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed here till now. So he's on this collision course with Esau. He knows he's going to meet Esau. And so he then coaches his messengers this, saying, This is what you say. This is how I want you to address my brother. And it's very placable language. He, in fact, calls Esau his lord. When you go into the uh, larger text here, in, in, into the rest of the chapter, and, and it's here where he, you know, he's in one group, his wives and children are in another group further back, and Jacob is making all these plans in case things go south, in case things go sideways. And so finally, Jacob is by himself. He realizes that he's in something that is over his head. He's encountered a problem that is bigger than him. One that he isn't going to get out through craftiness. And so in the text here in verses 24 to 31, we see that Jacob is wrestling with a man. And at first, it just seems kind of odd. Why is he wrestling with a man? And he wrestles with him to the breaking of the day. But this is no ordinary man he's wrestling with. 
In fact, we're going to find out it's not wasn't a man at all. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with it. And he said, referring to the man that Jacob was wrestling, and let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, this is what Jacob said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. Jacob refused to let this guy go. He knew this man was not an ordinary man. He knew that if he wrestled and contended, that he could get a blessing. And he asked for the man's name, and the man says, why do you ask that? And we then read, he blessed him there, and we pick up in verse 28, and he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince thou hast power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. So Jacob had to go through this wrestling to get the blessing this time. And he had to once again come face to face with God, face to face in the presence of God. And this angel, this man, whoever he is, names him Israel. For as a prince thou hast power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. So Jacob wrestled to get a blessing from God. And then as Jacob continues back, he's eventually going to come back to where Bethel is. So Jacob came to Luz, which is in the land of Canaan. Bethel. He and all the people that were with him. And he built there an altar and called the place El Bethel because there God appeared to him when he fled from the face of his brother. But Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, died, and she was buried beneath Bethel under the oak, and the name of that was called Alan Bakhtu. So he goes to Bethel. He builds an altar there. He's preparing to draw close into the presence of God. A tragedy happens. They, they bury Rebecca's nurse. And then as we go into verse 8 or verse 9, we're going to see that he's back in Bethel. God appeared unto Jacob again when he came out of Pat and Aram and blessed him. And God said unto him, Thy name is Jacob. Thy name shall not be called any more Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name. And he called his name Israel. So the Lord appears to him, confirms his new identity as Israel. Jacob had an identity change. He had a name change. Just like when we come to Christ, we gain a new identity in Christ. We're not the old man anymore. So Jacob had to go through this wrestling. He had to go through trials that, that brought mortification to his flesh. He had a bapt, uh, you could say kind of, sort of, a baptism of the Holy Spirit. It wasn't exactly the same as the baptism of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament, but he had this encounter with God where God freely revealed himself. He had another encounter that required a wrestling that you could say is analogous to a baptism of fire where he experienced sanctification, he experienced mortification of the flesh, and he gains this new identity now, an identity of Israel, a royal identity. So, wrapping up here, what does all this mean for the Christian life? We've talked about how Jacob went to Bethel. See, God in the presence of God. He saw the angels ascending and descending. He experienced God. God talked to him. Then he went on this diaspora. He suffered trials. He suffered tribulation. He suffered years in the wilderness. And then he returns back to the promised land, has another encounter with God, one that involved wrestling, one that involved spiritual warfare, contending for the prize. 
And then on that second one, his identity has changed. His name has changed from Jacob to Israel. I think there are three applications here to the Christian life. The first one is that we should trust God rather than human effort. When Jacob went to secure the blessing and the birthright through human effort, it backfired on him. He got, he got what he wanted, but he got a whole bunch of things he didn't want. And as a result, he went through 20 years of trials and tribulations. The second lesson is that our first encounter with Bethel is analogous to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When you come to Christ, you receive the Holy Spirit, and God freely gives. And you taste of the sweet presence of the Holy Spirit. You taste of the powers of the world to come. You see uh, just a touch of Christ as King. Then life happens. And we go through trials. We go through tribulations. We sometimes go through the long stint in the wilderness. But our second encounter at Peniel Bethel is a baptism of fire. Now, those who are in the military know, will know exactly what that is. In, in the military context, the baptism of fire is a term that they use to describe your first battle. The very first time you go out into combat and you've got your gun and you're stepping forward and the bullets from the enemy are coming at you and you're shooting. And before then, you don't know what you're going to do, but that baptism of fire helps define who you are. And the key to being a successful soldier is to be able to soldier through that, shoot back, gain the victory. Now, the baptism of fire in the Christian life isn't exactly like that, but it, it's similar. It's where as we suffer for Christ, as we go out and we enter into spiritual warfare, and we face the flaming darts of the enemy, and we wrestle and we prevail and we soldier and engage in spiritual warfare and persevere in our faith and overcome. That is the baptism of fire. And what is the promise that God gives us? What does John the Baptist say of Jesus? John says, I baptize with water, but he that comes after me will baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So, uh, closing here, if you don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, if you don't know the Lord, now is the time to repent. Now is the time to come to the Lord, to embrace him as Lord and Savior, saying, Lord Jesus, I admit I'm a sinner. I need you to save me. I, I confess that you're, you died on the cross and that your blood, shed blood, took away my sins. I trust you to save me. If you're backslidden, now's a good time to come back to God. For those of us that are mature Christians, you may have gone through trials. Now, and you're beginning to wonder, what's going to happen next? Am I going to get the victory? That's where you hunker down, you soldier, and you persevere in faith. And you contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. And you keep contending till you gain a victory, till God shows up, reveals himself to you, and you have the victory. Oh, this is good. So let us soldier on. Let us keep persevering. Let us not give up. If you're on the verge of giving up, now is not the time to give up. Now is the time to hang in there because God had your back. He will be with you. Praise you. We thank you, Father, for that promise. We, we thank you for this promises here. I'm going to open it up for any prayer that people may have. Uh, we thank you, Father, for what you're doing. And, Father, we just ask for an anointing on this, an anointing as people seek prayer. We pray all these things in Jesus' name.